In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Michael Ramsey, 100th Archbishop of Canterbury, used to teach that there is a natural order of things in creation, if you will, the order that things are meant to be. He expressed this simply, God, man, things. However, this order became disordered, with God moved to the bottom of the natural order, and even more dangerously, he suggested, with things, including weapons of mass destruction at the top. The Bible shows us that this natural order to creation very quickly unraveled because of humankind's willful disobedience resulting in estrangement from God, the Creator. And in the church, we call this the fall from grace. <coughs> The message of the Old Testament is God calling his people back to himself in a covenant relationship. Now, a covenant is a kind of contract between God and people in which an agreement is made. Put very simply, God says, do this and this, and I will treat you as my very own. I will protect you. The Ten Commandments that we heard in our first lesson today are at the heart of the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. They were the tools by which a very diverse people, twelve tribes, could become one family under God, God's chosen people, a beloved community where the relationships between them reflected the covenant relationship between God and his chosen people. The carrying of the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the tablets of the law, was a symbol of God walking with his chosen people, with his pilgrim people. And like the nomadic tribes that constituted God's chosen people, the Ark was also kept in a tent called a tabernacle. God tabernacled with his people on the move. It was only when they settled in the Promised Land that they built a temple in Jerusalem, which, like the tabernacle in the wilderness, was a sign of God's covenant relationship with his people and a means by which they could deepen their relationship with him. The blood of sacrifice offered there atoned for their sins, but because they were so often not in a state of grace, those sacrifices had to be offered again and again and again. In our gospel reading today, Jesus comes to that temple and he does something quite extraordinary. We know that the author of John's gospel chooses his images and words very carefully. The fourth gospel is not like the three synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. For a start, in John's gospel, we have a three-year ministry as opposed to one. And this passage, the cleansing in the temple, comes in John's gospel at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, whereas in the synoptic gospels, it comes just before Holy Week, after the triumphant entry on the day that we call Palm Sunday. So this placing of the cleansing of the temple must be very deliberate. In John's Gospel, we have heard the great prologue with its echoes of the first story of creation. In the beginning was the Word, culminating in the declaration that this Word became flesh, and dwelt among us. Significantly, that dwelling among us is the same root as the Hebrew word for tabernacling. In other words, when God becomes human in Jesus, he once again tabernacles. 
He pitches his tent among us. And that's why we behold his glory full of grace and truth. Then Jesus calls his first disciples. And then we have the first of seven signs in John's gospel. John deliberately uses the word sign rather than miracle. And the first of these signs takes place at the wedding at Cana in Galilee with the turning of the water into wine. Now, if you're still with me, weddings are about covenanted relationships. The stone water jars are for purification according to the law, but they are empty. And Jesus has them filled to the brim with water, which now becomes wine, but not any old wine, the very best wine. And then we are told that this was the first of the signs by which Jesus revealed his glory. In a moment, as we heard in our gospel, he's going to be asked for a sign. But we have to hold the first part of John's gospel together as we now enter the gospel story. He goes immediately to the temple. So it's going to be filled with symbolic meaning. The word made flesh, revealing God's glory, tabernacling with us, changing the water into wine, the first of his signs by which he revealed his glory. And now the word made flesh, the splendor of the Father, filled with grace and truth, who has revealed God's glory, enters the very place that represents God's covenanted relationship with his chosen people, the temple. And Jesus is filled with zeal, doing so at the time of Passover, the feast to remind God's people of liberation from slavery. This first section of John's gospel is so rich in meaning, filled with zeal, which is different from the human emotion of anger. Jesus makes a whip of cords and he drives out those selling animals. And what were these animals intended for? Sacrifice. He drives out the money changers. He overturns the money changers' tables. Now, my friends, this is not some kind of protest. Jesus is not acting like a protester against climate change. This is not the start of the Occupy movement. It's far more significant. For the word made flesh goes into the place of God's presence as God's presence filled with grace and truth. And his actions mean that for a short while, the sacrifices stop. Think about it. The driving out of the money changers, the animals and the birds, means that just for a little while, there could be no sacrifice in the temple. Why? What is John trying to get across to us? Because the greatest sign of the restoration of God's sovereignty over creation and the healing of broken relationships is found in the person of Jesus Christ, who himself would become the perfect sacrifice to bring about reconciliation once and for all. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up, says Jesus. But of course, he did not mean the physical temple, which, after all, when John's gospel was written, had already been destroyed for two or three decades. Jesus was talking about his own sacrificial death, his own resurrection, in which there would be a new creation, things put back in the right order. For Jesus, the temple pointed to the reality of God's presence. But when Jesus entered that temple, he filled it with his own presence. As Paul says to the Ephesians, his body fills everything. The fullness fills creation. 
in just three weeks, we will walk again the road to Calvary in order to celebrate the resurrection, the new creation. And that celebration of the Lord's passion, death, and resurrection should make a difference to our lives and to our attitudes and to our relationships. Don't be like those people who call themselves Christians in the census but for whom Good Friday is an inconvenience. Easter Day may be glorious, but without Maundy Thursday and Good Friday, it loses so much of its power. Why? Paul tells us in our epistle reading today, we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. You see, my friends, walking the way of the cross is countercultural and perhaps especially so today. But we proclaim Christ crucified, which is why we celebrate Christ's resurrection, the means by which the whole of creation is transformed and by which each of us can reach our full potential to be called the children of God, the brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, a beloved community that is like his glorified body, the presence of which fills the whole created order, but a body that still bears the wounds of love. For it is the eternal freshness of the wounds of love that is our encouragement, my friends, to become more like him who is made in the image of God and to make a difference outside of our church community. Or as Archbishop Oscar Romero once said, when we leave Mass, we ought to go out the way Moses descended Mount Sinai with his face shining, his heart brave and strong to face the world's difficulties. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.